that kind of is the content of the course uh, in that what is this relationship between systems I should write it in the middle systems and while I'm while I'm doing this I want you to think about uh, let's do some takeaways from the reading think about the takeaway from the reading and you've already thought about this um, and given the takeaway from the reading what is it that you would like from what's your target question for the lecture and by the way I'm very acutely aware and it causes some anxiety in me that the further we get back in history the less likely it is that you could care less about the content right you, are you guys aware of that because remember that first class when I said uh, one of the first urban formations in human history is Jatal Koyok who speaks who speaks Turkish am I pronouncing Chatal Huyuk properly. Chatal? Chatal? Huyuk. Huyuk. Uh, <laughs> 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 right? Remember, remember when I, <laughs> remember when I started talking about Chatal Huyuk? Yeah. And your body got all relaxed? Remember that? Yeah, I started caring. You stopped caring. You started caring when I talked about Chat Dalu you? Yeah. I don't get it. What, why should I teach it from the dawn of time up to the present? No. Okay. So we're doing it in reverse order. Remember, the biggest challenge of your careers is, you know, the thing. The threat of planetary death otherwise known as the thing, right? So if that's the biggest challenge you're gonna face in your career, what should your education do to help you prepare for that? You with me? Uh, so we go back in time, we say what has architecture demonstrated a capacity to do in relationship to planetary death? We look at the Dutch, we look at Singapore, we look at Made in Colombia. So now, how, how did people, how did designers know what to do in those examples? We go back to informal settlements. We go back to, it's step by step, back through history. And so here we are reading something from 1844 about the factory system and its relationship to urban form. What possible relevance could this have to the thing that will define your careers. That's the takeaway. So let's just shout out some takeaways. Go. I said uh, cities are designed by the bourgeoisie to function like a machine that couples with the economic system and the economically enslaved working populations. Pretty good, right? Any adjustments to that? Modifications? Amplifications? Additions? Extens extensions of that? That pretty much covers it. The city is a machine for producing great wealth no matter who gets hurt. Something like that, right? What else? Capital has ultimately destroyed societal advancement through the deregulation of production and the well being of the workforce and the environment. Wow, that's much bigger beyond the reading. There's some extra reading going on there, right? What else? The owners of the factories, high class and middle class people, is unaware of the terrifying situation that lies beyond the beautiful building facade of the main road, which are aimed to come to the Oh, thank you. That is beautiful. Isn't that good? So the thing that was, so if you compare uh, what Asha, Asha's what she just said was started big and it got straight to the architecture part, right? The facades of the streets is the architectural mechanism by which this occurs, right? So with that kind of takeaway statement, 
there's no doubt in anybody's mind that architecture has a role to play in the operations of these systems. Anything else? lessons uh, since uh, for the next few hours it's still Black History Month. One of the key lessons taught by the, um, the civil rights movement and its leadership is that race, not only is race a construct, uh, not only is race a cultural construct, but it, is, it was also deployed very, very explicitly and deliberately as a distraction from class. If you are a wealthy owner of capital uh, production, like a plantation owner after the Civil War, and you are worried about an alliance forming between the freed, freed slaves who are impoverished on these sharecropper farms, uh, because who are the sharecroppers? The freed slaves, and who else? the recent immigrants, the Italians, the Irish, and other uh, recent immigrants who are locked into this socioeconomic mechanism that perpetuates poverty and, uh, and reproduces impoverishment generation after generation. If you are the owner of capital and all of a sudden everybody gets to vote, aren't you scared? You should be scared. So what do you do? You talk to, uh, the, the, you divide the lower classes, the working class, you divide them up into groups and you get them to fight each other. So, but how long are they gonna be duped by that? I mean, maybe you'll get 10 years of deceiving them, but eventually they'll catch on that this is a deception of capital owners. Um, and so in the uh, 18, late 1860s, early 1870s, the owners of capital started telling stories of black men coming for your white women. Be very afraid. You know, maybe this will work for 10 years or so, but at least it will buy us 10 more years. But here we are 150 years later, and it's still working. That worked better than we thought, says the capitalist. This racism thing, this is working really well to keep the working classes divided and fighting each other so that we can go about our business unscathed and undisrupted by class warfare. So it's been a brilliant deception uh, that has worked not for the five or ten years that they thought it might work. It's worked for 150 years. Is there any sign that it's going to stop working soon? No, actually there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, we're good to go. We, let's do it another 150 years. Who's with me? Let's keep the working class divided and fighting each other so we can continue to accumulate the wealth in the upper 1%. It's a brilliant deception that's worked all too well. Well, let's teach it in school. Check. We just did that. So, but can our, but architects can't have any impact on this, right? What can architects do? We're just serving the needs of our clients, right? The systems are determined by the culture. And if the dominant culture is racism, 
welcome to the United States. If the dominant culture is racism, and the systems are set up to tolerate, it used to be the systems are set up to impose and perpetuate and deepen racism, slavery, Jim Crow, but if our systems are set up to tolerate racism, and this was referred to last night, Courtney Sharp's lecture, uh, where she said, eight of you were there, thank you. Um, she said, uh, there, there's, there's slavery, there's Jim Crow, there's the new Jim Crow, uh, but uh, there's now uh, a, a fight against affirmative action because that's racist. So um, the, the attempt to rebalance and undo the damage of the past, uh, the mechanisms for the mechanisms for doing the damage are now off limits to anyone attempting to undo the damage was the point she made last night, very clear. I thought that was brilliant. Thank you guys for organizing that. It was really a wonderful lecture. Um, and so culture feeds the systems, the systems feed the projects, right? So according to this diagram, Architects are powerless to do anything. Is that, is that okay with you? What, push back. What can architects do? I just do what my client tells me to do. Can influence culture. How do, how do we influence culture? By like designing for multiple different cultures or like so our projects can influence the culture. What else you guys got? Yeah. I don't think it's a matter of like constructing projects. It's more of starting from like the social ladder is down because like <coughs> like the the reading briefly talked about how like. Because you can like you can produce a project or something like that, and like, the people who are in charge don't like it. They won't they won't like allow for it. But like if it somehow does get looked up, they'll like somehow like you know mitigate it or like destroy it or something like that. So you're saying the only way to have an influence is to take control of the power structure. Yeah. And, and change the system and then work on the projects. Yeah. I mean, like, historically, that's kind of like what Duped, right? It's just, it's just, uh, it yeah. Is what it's because we had Barack Obama as president, and now look at us. Are you saying? Are you adding an arrow there? Well, there should be an arrow on all of the arrows. Like that? That's it. Yeah. And what's this? So, uh, Ms. Sharp mentioned an architecture firm not far from here. What's it called? Design Studio for Social Intervention. So what does their work look like? And this name, this name is pretty radical in and of itself. You mean design can intervene socially? That sounds like maybe in Colombia talk, right? So it'd be very interesting to see what evidence there is that design can actually influence systems and cultures. 
And she mentioned the acronym in passing, and I said, what? And she said, Design Studio for Social Intervention. So that I could tell you about it, so that you could tell us about it on Wednesday. Okay? So uh, given the takeaways that you guys collectively very clearly articulated, what then must this lecture do? What do you guys want from this lecture? And what's going on in all the laptops that are open? Are you guys taking notes? That's appropriate. I haven't got a pencil. Taking notes. Okay. <laughs> so, so now what? If this is our situation, what do you need from this uh, lecture? This is a partnership. I'm number four. I'm a little anxious that I'm not going to be able to satisfy your needs. <laughs> So what are your needs? Help me out. What should I try to achieve here? I don't want to waste your time. You've, this is part of the quarter million dollars, part of a quarter million dollar investment and in four years of your education. So there's a lot at stake here. Help me out. What do you need from this lecture? Don't be afraid to demand, to be demanding. That's, that's useful. What do you not want to hear? Go ahead, Brad. I think the reading that I like took the most from like was the city group reading. I feel like I that reading actually like, exposed a solution, and uh, I thought it was actually like a lot more informational rather than opinionated than the rest of the reading. Okay, that's good. City beautiful. And by city beautiful, do you mean Ebenezer Howard? So Garden City, but not not Jane Jacobs. That useful, I think. Both of those readings. Both are useful. It was interesting to me to see how you guys in your sketch writing you like lavished attention on Ebenezer Howard's Garden City diagram, and then yeah, Jane Jacobs, sure. Not me. Yeah, some of you were exceptional in this case. The, uh, the Jane Jacobs kind of hit home. Will and Aiden, David, you guys like Jane Jacobs is the is the bomb, right? Ebenezer Howard, whatever. Yeah. Okay. What else do you want in this lecture, Isa? So you're looking to history for hints on how to be impactful as an architect. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, she's the basically that I basically Yeah. So I kind of feel like looking at the diagram that we just did, kind of understanding, like, maybe on looking at capital as maybe a system, but then also as a Oh, thank you. Oh my God, I'm getting chills. So, in my long, tor tormented struggle with understanding economics, because remember, I'm the guy who walked through the library in the junior year, or sophomore year, for my architectural education, and I said, "Huh, I don't need to know this." I don't need to know that. 
I don't need to know anything about that whole section of the library. I can stay right here in the NA 7000 section of the Car Library of Congress. I have the big picture books of beautiful architecture. Ah, oh, thank God, right? But karma is a hard taskmaster. And uh, boy, have I been shut down in my desire to shut out everything beyond the boundaries of architecture with a vengeance. And I had to study, in order just to figure out how architecture works, I had to dig deep into economics. And one after decades, I'm here to tell you that Xavier's instinct confirms, uh, is confirmed by my deep study. Economics is more than just a natural system. Like, you can't fight this, the laws of supply and demand, right? That's just natural. Right? I agree with that. The supplies of uh, the laws of supply and demand is a reflexive system that if you got rid of it and put a bunch of people on an island, eventually it would come back. It is empirically effective as a strategy, as a system for managing resources. So there are systemic aspects to economics. However, the vast majority of what we think of when we say the word capitalism is not a system, a reflexive mechanism that would reproduce itself. It's actually a deliberate construction made by people in order to achieve certain outcomes. Uh, they look at what works and doesn't work and they uh, they do what works to concentrate wealth in the smallest number of hands possible. That makes culture a hybrid, that makes economics a hybrid thing. There are systemic components of it, but there are a lot of cultural components of the way economic systems work. That's why when I use the word capitalism, I like to emphasize it as a, uh, that when we hear today, if you watch the news and they talk about capitalism, it's really a specific brand of capitalism. I think of it as capitalism with a capital C and a trademark, which is different from capitalism with a small c. Capitalism with a small c is a system that is open to impacting. Uh, it, it operates as a system, and it's, uh, it's empirical in nature, and it's always shifting and changing, and you can understand the laws of supply and demand and other things that happen. But capitalism is a cultural construction similar to the cultural construct of race. It operates with very specific purposes in mind. It operates through systems, and it operates through, and some of those systems, some of the components of the systems are physical. That's what we should look at. So I don't think I'm going to be able to satisfy in this lecture the desire to show positive design. But what I hope to be able to do is to show how architecture and urban form operate as instruments of systems that reproduce cultural constructs. And if projects can reinforce systems and cultures, maybe the projects can be designed deliberately to change systems and ultimately have an impact on cultures. So we don't have to wait for Z to become uh, the next Mark Zuckerberg, or the, or and then leverage that wealth to become president of the world, and then all he can just direct the world to change its culture. From on top, you can direct, you can have an impact on culture, you can change systems, and then we can get to some good projects. You do that, Z. But in the meantime, 
don't give up on the possibility that projects can have systemic change and alter cultures ultimately because that's what history shows us. The projects influence systems and cultures. Any questions before we jump in? Okay. Fortunately, you guys, most of you, were here last summer. And the first lecture of last summer, do you remember? Do you have your notes? You don't remember that? So, oh, here's a point. 